An American missionary is held prisoner inside North Korea. Kenneth Bay remembers the two years that nearly killed him and the faith that kept him alive on today's 700 Club Interactive. Well, welcome to 700 Club Interactive. Today we are going to North Korea, and this is Kim Dong Chul. He's wiping away tears because he's just been sentenced to 10 years of hard labor. Kim, who's an American national, has been found guilty of crimes and espionage. We've got another one for you. This is 21 year old UVA student Otto Warmbier. Back in March, he was slapped with a 15 year sentence after he was caught stealing a propaganda banner. In North Korea, that's considered an act of hostility against the state. Now an NBA agent and political activist named David Sugarman is trying to secure his release. He's even coined a hashtag campaign on Twitter called We Want Warm Beer. It's unlikely that both men will serve the full duration of their sentences, and thank God for that. Most of the time, prisoners such as Kim and Warm Beer are released early, usually after the North Koreans extract something from the international community. And that's a little consolation for the people who have to spend weeks, months, sometimes years, living in misery, and it's also misery for their, their families. Well, just as Kenneth Bay, who lost two years of his life in a North Korean prison camp. On November 3rd, 2012, on a trip to North Korea, Kenneth Bay accidentally broke his own cardinal rule, never bring an external computer hard drive into the country. Now, North Korean authorities had it and him. Bay was jailed and quickly sentenced to 15 years of hard labor at a remote North Korean prison camp. He suffered torture, forced labor, and failing health for two long years. The prayers and efforts of family, friends, and strangers, and even the President of the United States, mobilized to bring Kenneth Bay home. Now Bay tells his story of those events in his book, Not Forgotten, the true story of my imprisonment in North Korea. With us now for the rest of the story is a man who for two years was just known by his number. Inmate 103. His real name is Kenneth Bay. And Kenneth, thank you for being with us and thank you for your courage. I uh, thank you. It well, takes a lot of courage to go to North Korea, uh, particularly uh, as a Christian, as a missionary, praying for North Korea. Um, wh wh why did you do it? I just want people to see the land for themselves so that we can go walk around the land and pray and also worship. God in behalf of North Korean because they're not allowed to know God and worship God. So I wanted to encourage the body of the Christ all over the world to be able to embrace and have compassion for the people in North Korea. So I organized some tour mm -hmm. for people to go and see them for themselves. Um, a lot of people, our viewers may not know that a hundred years ago, Pyongyang in North Korea, the capital of North Korea, had more churches than any other city in Asia. That's correct. Um, and, and to see that completely gone, I think there's just one church now, uh, and that's a showcase church. Uh, and, you know, you can, you can debate, is there any real Christian presence in North Korea? Um, how did all of that happen? How did, how did we go from the most no number of churches to one? Well, as you can, as you know, that, that Korea went through transformation after Japanese surrender, mm -hmm. and it was divided. That Korea was divided into two, two different parts, one uh, South and North North Korea, and after uh, Soviet uh, took over the north, northern part of the Korea, they established a communist regime under Kim Il Sung, and the ones after Kim Il Sung take, uh, took the power. He was a, he became the only uh, God, deity in a way, that uh, they can tolerate. So all the churches were closed, or the missionaries are, are expelled, and um, uh, people were in prison. So and now they have a couple of churches in Pyongyang so that, that they can tell the world that they do have freedom of religion. Mm -hmm. But in reality, they ban any type of religious activity in North Korea other than their own religion called Juche. 
Yeah, they, they, he, he created his own. That's correct. Um, and it's trans, juche it's, mm -hmm. means self-reliance, and it's all, uh, we as a people, as North Koreans, mm -hmm. we need to be self-reliant. We can't be reliant on the West. Yes. There's also a real um, strong anti-American uh, movement within the culture, and it's based on the Korean War, and it's based on a sense of persecution. And I was told again, when I visited, I was told again and again, there were more bombs dropped on Pyongyang by American bombers than there were people living in the city. And, That's and, right. And that was repeated again and again and again. And it seems to be fostering a culture of fear uh, within the people. They, it's, it's been called the hermit kingdom for a long time, but it, it seems to be self-perpetuating by what they continually say. That's right. They have, that's why they built, um, they wanted to build wall in, in, in that sense so that the people within the country will not be able to be, uh, to have info, information or have knowledge of what's really going on outside. And in their world, they wanted to protect their own people from any type of invasions or any kind of uh, um, the interaction with the, the, with the West. It, it's been my prayer now for 20 years, it's been 20 years since I was there, that somehow uh, those walls would come down, uh, that somehow the Christians in the South could be reunited. I mean, we're talking about families that need That's to be right. reunited that have been separated now for so long since, since the war ended, since World War II ended. Um, is that what you were about? You, you were trying to essentially have a prayer walk in, in North Korea? Yes. Um, I, I, believe, I believe that the power of prayer can transform the nation. So when, we, when I organized tours and more than uh, 300 people participated in this special activity from 17 different nations, and they gathered together, we walked around the nation and we just simply uh, pray and worship and then meet people and love the people as Christ loved us and hoping that someday the spiritual wall around the country will fall, that they'll be able to worship God and know God just like anybody else from outside. And these are, this is the only country still cut off from the rest of the world, only country still uh, people lost or forgotten the name of Jesus Christ. Hmm. You got caught because you had a hard drive. Yes. You brought a hard drive in, and, and what was on the hard drive? I brought in the portable hard drive by accident, and that hard drive contained some documentary footage about North Korea mm -hmm. produced by the Western media. Uh -huh. And therefore, the angle of the, you know, the video is not what they will appreciate. It was about real It's not inside. the image of North Korea yes, they want out there. They want to have, so they were disturbed by it, uh -huh. and saying that is, why did you bring such an anti-North Korean material into the country? What was, a, what was the reason for bringing it in? And I told them that it was purely by mistake. I didn't have a chance to take the hard drive out of my briefcase before I crossed the border. I imagine that didn't go over well. Oh, yeah, they didn't. They, they, <laughs> they don't give you a mistake. Yes. Yeah, they didn't think it was a mistake. Uh, and, and people who haven't been there just don't, don't get it. It's, it. It is a culture where there's only two television stations, mm -hmm. uh, both of which are completely controlled by the state, both of which essentially have the same programs. That's correct. They don't have access at all to Western media, let alone Chinese media or Japanese media or South Korean media. They don't have access to anything. Yes. Uh, internet is impossible. Uh, and f the, the lingering memory for me is there's no advertising allowed. The only posters <laughs> you see are yes. posters to the Supreme Leader. Uh, everything else is banned. There's, there's no advertising. It was just, it was so curious to me. No one could, uh, the, the whole concept of free speech, free thought, uh, just doesn't exist. That's correct. And they said they have to limit, uh, if they have to limit the right of free speech because uh, they cannot tolerate anyone criticizing their own leader or governments. So therefore, they said if one person starts speaking negatively about government, it will spread. So they said, um, you know, so we have to control it so that, that we can be united as one body one nation mm -hmm. under the 
leadership of the Kim Il Sung, now Kim Jong Un. What, why? Explain for us why is it so important that they have that unity? What, what what's fueling that? It's it's not just to protect the leader, but their 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 unity is based on we need to protect ourselves as a people. Because there are whole countries now um, is more built on 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 this the, you know, almost like worshiping the leader. So it has become more like a religious a religious state uh, in their own way. So for them, um, for to be able to protect their people, meaning that is, if there's Western influence coming in through the form of religions or any other thought, they think that they will, it will be a, it's a threat because they will bring the unity and bring out divisions and confusions, and then they will lose faith in their leader. Once they lose faith in leader, they will, then they, can, they may turn uh, uh, against the, their leadership. So they cannot tolerate any other uh, religions or thought that are coming in to influence their own people. Okay. Let's talk about Operation Jericho, because that seems to be the thing that really got you into trouble. What was that? Yes. And, and I imagine you'd pick a different name for it <laughs> if you could. <laughs> well, the Operation Jericho uh, was the program that I, I got. It, it was, Oper Operation Jericho was, came from the Bible itself. Mm -hmm that as the Israelite, uh, you know, walking into the promised land for the first time, the first city to take on was Jericho. As God, they, but they did what God told them to do by circling around the city and pray and worship. And on the seventh day, the wall came down. So I got the, uh, the word from the Bible and mm -hmm. say, what if we do this? What if we go to the city of Rasan, which is about 200,000 people, uh, first city after the, you know, fr uh, from the border of the China, and uh, how about we go there, circle around the city, walk around, and pray and worship? Would that spiritual wall will come down? That was the whole purpose of naming Operation Jericho. That, you know, obviously, that sounds more like a military term right. to them, that that was a real invasion I was really uh, orchestrating. I've been, so I've been telling them, no, it's not. It's just a metaphor, and it just came from the Bible. It's, uh, it's for us as Christians to come to just pray and worship. That was the... The, there was a whole purpose of that. And then they say, you brought people to pray, not for us, but against, against us. us right. So that, that we will come, that we will come, you know, we will we down. down right. Yeah. So therefore, we have to charge you with attempting to overthrow the governments. So for them, it was a valid point of them to say, you planned it, you plotted it, and that now you're going to pay for it. Mm. What would you do differently? First of all, probably I would not name your Operation Jericho <laughs> to begin with. I'd probably say some love walk or something like that, a compassion walk or something, rather than using the military term like that. But I probably wouldn't do anything differently because the whole purpose was to go and show the compassion of Jesus Christ to people who do not know. Mm -hmm. And just having the Christians walking in and just greeting and say hi and just to play with the kids. We, uh, we play soccer with the children there. We went into the classroom and interact with the children in English. And so we built a lot of uh, special bridge with uh, many people. So up until the time that I was arrested, I didn't feel any fear. Mm -hmm. I didn't, there was any uh, God's special uh, access. So it was God's special favor was there. So we enjoyed the time in North Korea uh, as a Christians going in. Not, uh, up until that I got arrested. Yeah. What, what, what was it like? For you, what was your heart reaction when you heard the sentence? Well, I knew that I would be sentenced with hard labor and mm -hmm. for just a matter of the, how many years I was going to get. But this is what the North Korean government official, the, one of the prosecutors told me uh, prior to the trial. It doesn't, it's not that important how many years you get. It's what happened after the trial, how your governments react and how is upon their attitude about what's gonna, there is, it's, it's, it's really dependent on the attitude of the you know, US government. So I knew that I was just being there as a political pawn. Isn't uh, that kind of cynical on their side? Yes, it is, but so, but I was prepared. I mean, don't they recognize that? that well, but. It's a for, show trial, it's a show mm -hmm. sentence, it's a show well, offense. I'm sure they know that as uh -huh. well, but they, for them, uh, you know, their, their knowledge is like this. It's like I, you know, you know, they were the victim. Mm -hmm. I was aggressor. 
and therefore they think a trial is needed to make so that that, that they can have it uh, can be documented it and so mm -hmm. that the um, uh, US government will be able to send someone to acknowledge my wrongdoing and apologize for my wrongdoing and then assurance that they will never happen again so this kind of things what they were looking for maybe there was a reason why I was held for such a long time. Now, the verse that comes to mind, be gentle as doves <laughs> and wise as serpents, mm -hmm. that uh, in everything we do as Christians, we need to absolutely be non-threatening. Um, what was it like when the, the prison doors shut? Because at that point in time, it's not a show trial anymore. Yes. Uh, there's no political points being made. You're, you are now in prison. Mm -hmm. What was that like? I didn't really expect to uh, go to prison even because I thought that after trials, uh, somehow I'll be going home soon. Mm -hmm. But uh, I found myself in, in, in labor camp and um, working the field uh, from 8 o'clock in the morning until 6 o'clock in the evenings, six days a week. Um, it was pretty tormenting and it was very difficult uh, to, because I never done any physical labor like that before, especially in the prison camp. But uh, when the midst, midst of suffering, so I have to rely on God solely. So I literally have to put on the full armor of God daily. In the morning, I spend time in worshiping and praying and reading Bible, asking God to help me to get through this day. They let they, you have a Bible in the prison? Yes. Um, they wanted to make sure, because I'm a foreigner, mm -hmm. that they wanted to make sure that uh, I can tell the word that that, you know, the, the, my human right has not been violated. Mm -hmm. So therefore, as, especially as someone as missionary, I had the Bible with me. So they let me keep the Bible. I was able to read the Bible uh, whenever I can uh, during the free time that I had other than working. So I solely rely on uh, meditating the Word of God daily. Really I continue to you know, uh, put trust in the Lord that, that He will be my rescuer. You reached a point where you stopped praying for your release. Mm -hmm. uh, what, did you, what did you start praying for then? After being there for about a year, I realized that hope is not coming anytime soon because there were previous uh, attempts by U.S. government that it failed to get me home. And this is when I received a letter from my mom. My mom said that you need a faith like Daniel's three friends. That, that my God is able to save us, but if he does not, I will not bow down. And I said, I need that kind of faith. And I was reminded that, does God really want me to stay here? Is this his will for me, for him to put me here and let me stay? Because I've been praying that, oh, take me home, send me home, uh, bring me home. But I have to wonder, Lord, do you want me to stay? It took uh, about three weeks for me to go through it in, in agony. Finally, I did this prayer. Lord, not my will, but your will be done. And I give up my right to go home. Use mm -hmm. me as a blessing to the people of North Korea. God was reminded that I'm a missionary in chain, represents God's kingdom. And he said, you are not there as a prisoner. You are there as a son. You are the light that, that, that I brought in to, to shine the darkness. And I have to say, Lord, use me. And after that, uh, my attitude toward the people around me changed. I'm like starting to have more compassion. I'm starting to see from the God's eyes and say, they are the lost people living in darkness. So that's the turning point of my life. And I say, Lord, use me. And God opened many doors after that for me to be able to interact and talk to people, to let people know that there is more life than what they know. What did, how did they respond to that? In your book, you say you actually get to talk about God to the guards. Uh, did, they, did they respond? Did they have, did you have any impact on it? Well, when I was focusing on myself, the door did not really open. Mm -hmm. After I gave up my right to go home, Lord started opening the door opportunities. I was starting to talk to them in, in daily, you know, their daily life, talk about family and friends and talk about, and then they started asking some like uh, some serious question like then they're they're getting some advice like parenting and marriage and I was doing some premarital counseling with one couple of guards there, and then they were starting to open up and say, "You are different than other prisoner we had, because we are the we are the guard and you are the prisoner. Why do you seem happier than us? Where does your hope come from?" 
And this is the, how the Lord opened the door for them. It's like, you know, we, it's like, this doesn't make sense. Where does hope come from? I said, my hope come from God. And they wanted to know a little more. And then they ended up asking several questions. One is, if I believe in God like you, and do I get anything out of it? What's the benefit? Mm -hmm. The second thing they ask is that if I believe in God like you, then uh, what do I have to pay to the church? And is that uh -huh. an entrance fee or membership fee? That's what their term was. But they were asking for what's the price of following Jesus? Mm -hmm. And so I did not have a clear gospel presentation with them day by day, but I have to live it as someone who was sent by God because I know that maybe I may be a only Jesus they ever see in their lifetime. Because I heard from one of the uh, investigator in Raji, in the first city I was detained, and, he, and they, he asked me this sincerely these questions. I heard about God before, but I never heard about Jesus before. So where does Jesus live, in China or North Korea? There were sincere questions. I still remember that. Mm -hmm. And then he was, he's from Pyongyang, known to be the Jerusalem of the Far East in 100 years ago. And no one in North Korea now remember uh, the name of Jesus anymore. So for me, being there, they know I'm a missionary and, and I'm a pastor. And they're living among them as a prisoner. And they will see something is different about you. And I said, it's not me, it's Jesus who is in me, shine the light. Amen. Amen. A modern day Apostle Paul. If you want to know more about this, this is a wonderful book, Not Forgotten, The True Story of My Imprisonment in North Korea. Uh, it's available in stores nationwide. And Kenneth, thank you for being with us. And thank you for being a witness. That's wonderful. God bless you. God bless you more. We'll be right back after this. The Yazidis are an ancient people who live mostly in the Nineveh province of northern Iraq. Their Muslim neighbors have persecuted them for centuries, and ISIS has been committing genocide against them since they took over their homeland. One Christian group has been ministering to these people just a few kilometers from the ISIS front lines. Chuck Holton brings us the story from the Iraqi city of Sinjar. Mount Sinjar made international headlines in 2014 when tens of thousands of Yazidis fled into these hills to escape ISIS, carrying little more than the clothes on their backs. It was midsummer, and hundreds died of thirst and exposure on the trek. Eventually, the world community came together to deliver water and food to those left stranded on the mountain. Two winters have come and gone, and there are still thousands of Yazidis living in makeshift camps while down below, Kurdish soldiers have established a perimeter around the city of Sinjar, which was held by ISIS for a year and a half. When they were finally pushed out last November, they left the city an uninhabitable ruin. Most Yazidis won't be able to return to Sinjar for years, if ever. But help is coming from an unlikely place, the country of Burma, also known as Myanmar. These Burmese Christians have come to Iraq to give aid and training to the Yazidis and the Kurdish army, and they understand persecution better than most. They belong to a group called the Free Burma Rangers. David Eubank is the founder. For the past 20 plus years, we've been in Burma in the different conflict areas, sharing the love of Jesus, giving people help and getting the news out. And then last year we were invited here, and this is our fourth trip where we've come back to help the Kurdish people under attack by ISIS. The Free Burma Rangers has made a name for itself, going into conflict zones around the world and helping the world's most vulnerable people. Dave's background and military experience made him uniquely prepared for this kind of ministry. My background, growing up as a missionary kid in Thailand, hunting since I was very small, running around the jungle, also in the Rangers, and then later in Special Forces, all that enabled me to understand how do you function in a war zone? How can you help people? What's realistic? What's not realistic? What can you really do? This trip, the Free Burma Rangers have been here for six weeks, spending time with frontline troops conducting training and providing medical care. They've also brought over $20,000 worth of donated warm clothing for the Yazidis living on top of Mount Sinjar. But Dave doesn't do this alone. He brings his wife and three children because they believe these Yazidi children can more easily relate to the gospel that way. I have faith in God that he will pr 
protect me wherever I go and wherever our family goes. ISIS is a very strong force that needs to be stopped and there are still women and children held captive by ISIS. Sinjar just mostly looks like rubble and buildings have been destroyed and many have just been flattened. We're driving through the city of Sinjar and starting to notice that there are civilians coming back in. Even just a, a second ago saw a shop that was open. Uh, people are kind of scavenging around through the ruins, picking up whatever they can find that's useful, and uh, just starting the process of putting their lives back together. One of those families was fortunate that ISIS used their home as a headquarters, and so it wasn't destroyed. They've opened a bakery to sell bread to the soldiers who are guarding the city. As the first families start to come back into the shattered city of Sinjar, the FBR team is here conducting a good life club and teaching these Yazidi kids that God's love is deep and wide. One man we met told us ISIS kidnapped his wife in 2014, and he hadn't heard from her until three days before this interview. She called to say she was being held in a prison in Ramadi and that ISIS was now asking for a ransom of $5,000. Before he could finish his story, his phone rang. It was his cousin, a 15-year-old boy, captured about the same time as his wife. The young man had been taken to an ISIS training camp in Syria and was pleading for help to escape. Everyone had thought he was dead. As ISIS is slowly being pushed out of Iraq, they're starting to try and ransom their captives back to their families. And despite the cost, these Yazidis are desperate to get their loved ones back. What would you do if your wife was captured two years ago with your baby kids? What would you do, really? I think you would move heaven and earth to go save them. And that's what we need to do. For the time being, Dave and his team are continuing to do what they can to shine the light of hope into a very dark place. Oh, hey, hello, hey, hello, infantry. Oh, hey, hello, hey, hello. From Mount Singer, I'm Chuck Holton for CBN News. The life of Rangers, the life for me. Today we've been showing you two stories, wonderful stories, of people that have given up their right to go home in order to go to hard places, the very hardest places, in order to share the love of Jesus Christ, to let, them, let people know how big God's love is. If you feel that tug, that call to do that, don't ignore it. Uh, develop it and see what God would have you do, how he would use you. Not all of us are called to go, but if you're not called to go, you're at least called to send. And so get involved. Get involved in preaching the gospel around the world. And together we can all look forward to this wonderful verse from Zephaniah. On that day, I will gather you together and bring you home again. God bless you. We'll see you again.